Please open your Bibles to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 18. It's good to see so many here this morning. I will echo what Landy said for the announcements if you're visiting with us. If you have any questions about the things that we do in our worship service or the things that we talk about in our lesson this morning, please feel free to approach myself or somebody and ask those questions. We'd be glad to sit down and visit with you about this all-important subject Christ's church. Matthew 16, verse 18, please. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. One of the more well-known statements probably of Jesus, and some of the controversies that came from it, no doubt influenced that, but, but I want us to think about that statement Jesus makes. My church, my church. We live in a, in a culture and in a world, in a part of a world especially, that, that understands, or at least thinks that it understands, the concept of church, what it is and what it is not, how we church. And sometimes it's used in that way, it's almost used as a verb, that we church, or that we, we do church stuff, and so we kind of kind of confuse some of those concepts and those ideas, I think. If I were to ask you what you think about when you think of the word church, what immediately comes to your mind? Is it simply what we are doing here? Is it what we are taking part of this morning? Is it involving some aspects of worship? Is it it a denominational thing? Is it something beyond that? I, I think that we sometimes struggle figuring out just where we stand on the word church, what it means. No doubt that is influenced by our culture, and no doubt it is influenced by the last several hundreds of years of Roman Catholicism and even the last several hundred years of denominationalism. We can't hardly get away from those tendencies in our own thinking. We think church and we think organization. We think a entity of some sort, where instead maybe what we should do is think about it the way the Bible uses the term. The church is the people. We think about those concepts too often when we come to the text. And I want us this morning to look at a few observations about Christ's church and what it is in the book of God. And I think it will become rather obvious what we're talking about this morning. At the outset, I will make the point, and I'll make it again in a moment. We need to see those distinctions between what the universal church is, we sometimes say, the saved of all the ages, and then what the local church is. And so we need to see those distinctions in our own thinking. Some of this is influenced by our culture. Some of it is influenced by our own brethren. We hear sometimes very flippantly the church or the church stuff or churchy stuff. And I think we need to be very cautious about being so despairing when it comes to the body of God's people, that for which Christ died. This is important stuff this church stuff. And so let's be very careful in the way that we think about the church. A few observations going through lots of scripture this morning. Number one, the church that Christ talked about in Matthew 16 and verse 18. This church that Jesus says in the text, he will build, was originated by God. Let's look at Ephesians 1, please. Ephesians 1. Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3. Paul would say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. I want you to notice all of the pluralities of Paul's language here, us and we. Folks, that's what he's talking about, is the saved body of people, the church. 
But he's obviously not talking about a local sense because this is so broad in its description. He's describing all the people that God saves, the saved of all the ages. Notice, this was in the mind of God, verse 4, before the foundation of the world. That is, before God designed the world, before God laid the foundations of the world, this group of people, this body of people was in his mind. His plan to save, his plan to redeem was already there. This is important stuff. Go to chapter 3, please. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Some of the same concepts come out. In verse 8, he says to me, whom less than the least of all the saints this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all people see <coughs> what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the age has been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, now again, think about all the eternal things he's discussing here. That this manifold, multi-layered, multifaceted wisdom of God is expressed most clearly in the body of saved people, in the church. And that through the church, the wisdom of God is expressed Folks, this is all the things God originated in His mind and in His will. He purposed these things. And even here in this text, it says, before, before the ages, at the beginning of the ages, the wisdom of God expressed. Let, let's plug in some Old Testament stuff here. Go to Isaiah, second chapter, please. Isaiah, the second chapter. I, I want us to see how this plays out, practically speaking. Isaiah, chapter 2. Isaiah, the second chapter. 700 years or so before Christ Jesus walked in the flesh on the earth, 700 years, mind you, God through Isaiah says, this is Isaiah 2, verse 2, Now it will come about at the, in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, let us, uh, to the house of the God of Jacob so that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. See that? 700 years before Christ. He says this is what's going to happen. Jump to Daniel 2. Daniel the second chapter. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel the second chapter. We're still talking hundreds of years before, four or five hundred years before Jesus walked in the flesh. Daniel 2, verse 44, in the middle of a section where he is revealing, Daniel is revealing to Nebuchadnezzar the, the, uh, the, the contents of his dream. In verse 44, he says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Wow, seems like we just sang something about that, didn't we? This is where you nod. Yes, yes, we did. We did just sing a song that expressed that very thing. He says it'll happen. It'll never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all the kingdoms. But it itself will endure forever. Joel 2, please. Joel, the second chapter. Joel, please. Joel 2, please. Verse 28. Joel 2, verse 28, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will be, come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, so we've got three texts, by the way, all in the second chapter of those books. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2. Three texts saying, here's what's going to happen. It's going to come about. God says, I'm going to establish my rule. You're going to see it and all people will know it. You go into the gospel accounts. We won't turn to this. But in the gospel accounts, 
you have the prophets saying, John, over and over again, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the beginning of the message that Jesus preaches is it's near. In Acts the second chapter, Acts chapter 1, excuse me, over and over and over again through the Gospels, we have here it is, it is coming. And even in Mark 9, Jesus says it's going to come with power. In Acts 1, Acts 1 verse 8, what we're doing is following this little thread through the text. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus says to the apostles, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You, you just kind of see it crossing over a little bit. Three Old Testament texts saying here it's going to happen. It's coming forward. It's coming to pass. You're going to see the day of the Lord. And in Acts 1 verse 8, here it is. With power, Jesus says. And then chapter 2. Beginning in the first few verses, the apostles have the Holy Spirit fall on them in verse 4. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. That would be with power, folks. You skip down just a few verses into verse 16. This is what was spoken to you by the prophet Joel. And it will come to pass, verse 17, In the last days, says God, I will pour out my Spirit in all flesh. Your sons, your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out in those days my spirit. They will prophesy. They will show wonders in the heaven above and in the signs in the earth beneath. Blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, but the, before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see what Peter does? Peter takes that passage we just read in Joel 2, ties it right into the events of Acts 2, and says, ladies and gentlemen, the day that they, that they spoke about is finally here. This day in Acts 2, where God's rule, His people will recognize His rule, and then they go about living under His rule. And from there on, you follow that little thread through Scripture, you see these people working together. This thing that was originated in the mind of God in operation. Skip down just a few verses in chapter 2. Verse 31. He ties in another passage of prophecy of David and says, He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstools. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ is Messiah. Lord denotes ruler. Isn't that what we were talking about in Daniel 2? And in Isaiah 2, even in Joel 2, that Jesus, the Messiah of God, would be established as the rightful ruler of God's people. That he would lead them as the Lord, as the Master, as the Sovereign. Folks, that's exactly what the church is, isn't it? The church is this body of people that recognize the sovereignty of, of Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In fact, we often make that point, that he is Lord. He is master. We sometimes say the king of kings and lord of lords. Folks, all of this was originated in the mind of God. 700 years before Jesus, he's making promises. And then you fast forward a few hundred years and he's still making promises. And then you fast forward just a few decades and he's still making promises. And then what happens when you get to the gospel accounts? What happens when you get to Acts? He keeps his promises. I'll, I'll tell you, folks, to think about some of that is a very comforting thing because God makes some grandiose promises, doesn't he? And yet what he does over and over and over again is keep those very promises. You can rest assured he'll keep his promises to you as well. This body of people originated by God. Number two, it is headed by Christ. Go to Colossians 1, please. Colossians, the first chapter. 
Colossians chapter 1 in your New Testament. Colossians, Colossians 1. Notice the phrasing of Paul's words here. Notice this, Colossians 1.18. In reference to Jesus, he says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He is the head of the body, the church. Headship here denotes leadership. An organization, an organism, a structure is only as good as its head is. Do we not see that even in the corporate world sometimes? You've seen a major, a major organization collapse because the head was corrupt. I'll tell you right now, it's kind of the same with a physical body. That's why they take head injuries so seriously, don't they? People that work in the hospitals, they take those pretty serious, don't they? Because a head runs everything. A head leads everything. The body goes where the head tells it to go. The body operates exactly the way the head tells it. This denotes the lordship of Jesus all over again. He is the head of the body, the church. That means what we do is not up for discussion or debate, folks. That means how we operate is not up for, for, for just individualism. We follow the directives of the head of the body. But I also would be amiss if I didn't at least address the fact this denotes ownership. You say the phrase, the church of Christ. What do you think about first? I think the, my fear is too many people think the denomination. I say the church of Christ and somebody thinks just like the Baptist. That's not what I'm talking about. See, church of Christ means it belongs to Christ. It's not just about the sign on the road, folks. It's about a body of people who belong to Jesus Christ. By the way, it would be just as biblically accurate to say the church of God. Because it denotes God owns this body of people. To say the church of God in Christ Jesus, it would be just as right to say that. The church of the firstborn. That's used in Hebrews. Folks, the, the title is not about a denominational association. The title denotes ownership. I'm part of a body of people who belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And, and so... I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using that phrase, but we need to make sure we understand what the phrase means. This is a church of Christ. This is a body of people, a collective organization right here in this location that belongs to Him. Amen. And so everything we do is directed out of Him and our reverence for Him. Just a quick passage, chapter 3 of Colossians. Chapter 3 of Colossians. This is exactly what Paul stresses in this passage as well. That in all things he might have preeminence. That is, we might recognize his sovereign lordship. Verse 17. He says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Why does he say such a thing? Because this body of people is headed by Jesus. He is the leader, the ruler and so what we do is consistent with everything he has told us to do. No guesswork, not a free-for-all. We have structure to our work, structure to ourselves because of him. Number three, this is organized on a local level. Now, I, want to, I want to explain that, what I mean by that. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18 that he's going to establish his church. That is, this body of saved individuals. We're in Colossians. Just flip over a few passages to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. This is the difference of the universal body of people, that is, the saved of all the ages, and the difference of the local body of people. You, you see, if we want to think about it like this, Paul is part of the universal body of the saved of all the ages because Paul was saved back in those days, was he not? And so he's part of this universal body. But that does not mean Paul is part of the Northwest Church of Christ. Do you see the difference? The universal and the local. Paul would say in Philippians 1 verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So he's writing to the local church here, to the church in Philippi. And he describes every one of them in those three terms. In one of those three terms, the bishops, deacons, or the saints. 
Same body of people, though. The local church. Flip over a few passages to 1 Timothy 3, please. 1 Timothy 3. Same concept being used here. In chapter 1, verse 3, he tells Timothy, I'm leaving you in Ephesus. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to work and make sure there's not false doctrines taught. And you're going to make sure that you're building up the people so that they know what they're supposed to do. In chapter 3, he then describes the work of a bishop. Same office as described in Philippians 1. He says, if a man desires position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop goes on to describe the work of a bishop. And then in verse 8 and following, he describes the work of deacons. Titus 1 compares to this with the work of the shepherds. Each local church is to, be, is to be designed like this. In fact, that's what he says in Titus 1 and verse 5, that, that t- Titus is there to set in order the things that are lacking. They didn't have leadership, didn't have elders, and so his job was to help get some. You see this even back in Acts the 13th chapter. Please look at that passage. Acts the 13th chapter. In Acts 13... Paul and Barnabas are in the church at Antioch. Acts 13, verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch. See the distinction? He's not saying the whole church everywhere. He's talking about local church, the church at Antioch. He says, here are these teachers who are in this church. And so verse 2, the Holy Spirit wants... Barnabas and Saul, soon to be Paul, separated to go into a work. And so verse 3, when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Who's the they? The local church, the church at Antioch. In chapter 14 of Acts, you follow Paul's preaching in Acts 13 and Acts 14. He preaches all over some, some southern Galatian area, the southern Galatian area. In Acts 14 verse 23, They go back through the area they had just preached, strengthening the disciples. In verse 23, they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now now think about that again. Acts 13, he's preaching. Acts 14, he's helping make Christians. It's not until Acts 14, verse 23, that he goes back through and helps appoint shepherds in those congregations. I've sometimes heard someone say, well, a church is not actually scripturally organized until it has shepherds. I don't think that's true. I think a church can be here without shepherds. But the goal is to have shepherds. Thank God we have good shepherds in this congregation. I'm going to tell you, you've been in a congregation where they have no shepherds, it's a little different. The goal is to have shepherds. That's where we're supposed to work towards, and the goal is maintaining good shepherds and building men to be shepherds for the next generation. But here you have local churches organized according to the pattern of Scripture. These men who serve in this capacity are there for a servant's work. Look at Acts 4, please. Acts, the fourth chapter. Acts, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. I'm going to keep you on your toes. Ephesians 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the perfect knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice, it's a long sentence that all goes back to verse 11. God created offices that are to help the church do these things, grow up to help the church mature and develop and not be children tossed about by all the heretical doctrines out there, but mature individuals able to stand on their own two feet. And the offices he lists here, apostles and prophets, 
Not here anymore. Evangelists and pastors and teachers or teaching pastors. See, I, I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I'm a minister of the gospel. We have pastors. Same word here is bishops, elders, shepherds. Far too often, I'm afraid what we have is we're thinking about bosses. That's not the idea, folks. Shepherds, elders, pastors, bishops, they're not bosses. They're leaders. They're servant leaders. And that's a totally different deal. But the, the mindset is almost like corporate America. These, in, these men, they're the bosses. They're the ones who write the checks. They're the ones who send out the firing notices. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about servant spirits, servant individuals who are helping the congregation grow and mature. And by the way, that's the role all of us have to help this congregation mature, to help this congregation grow and develop. It's not just the burden of the official capacity of the, official capacity of the shepherds. It's every part, working together, verse 16, doing its share. Where are you at in that discussion? Our shepherds work really hard to help this congregation develop, mature, and grow. Are you doing your part? Well, I'll tell you, the easy application to make here is, you got to be here. You want this congregation to help you grow, you got to be here. We need to give that some consideration. Organized on a local level. You never see the universal church in action. You never see the churches of all over the world coming together in one central location to accomplish a goal. Instead, what you have is local churches doing local church work, which is a very specific work. Local churches have a specific work. Staying in this text... We have a job where we are helping each other develop and grow that the whole body might grow itself. When we're doing our part, we're helping do the part here. We're building and maturing and developing. And there are three things you see the church doing in the New Testament. Three things and only three things. You see the church involved in evangelistic efforts, teaching the lost. That's what they were doing in Acts 13, folks. We just read it. They sent them out to go and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see the, the congregation of the, of the New Testament involved in edification. That's what we're talking about here, building up the body. And you see the church involved in helping monetarily in some cases. Benevolent work, alms. And every time we see that, it is for needy saints. Our gentlemen that serve on the table and our gentlemen that serve for the, uh, for the contribution, they will sometimes read these texts that deal with these very things. Especially they've read a lot lately from 1 Corinthians 8 or 2 Corinthians 8. We're to be cheerful givers. It's the passage that's on the board. That's part of our work in this location to help build up this congregation, to help edify, to help educate, to help evangelize, and to help serve when we're called upon through benevolence or alms and always for needy saints. You could see this in a couple of other passages. We're not going to turn to them. But this is something we're supposed to be passionate about. Zealous for good works, he would say in Titus 2. That's what we are. We're zealous for good works, and the good works described in the New Testament. All of these things, folks, the three works of the church, build out of who we see Jesus to be in the Gospels. It's not divorced from him. We see Jesus being generous. We see Jesus teaching. We see Jesus helping those around him. It's exactly what the church is supposed to do, exactly what Christians are supposed to do. Help those around them. And so the, the local church has a duty to the world around us in spiritual things. And the individual Christian has a duty to the world around us in both spiritual and physical things. And we need to be very serious about it. And then finally... The church as described in Scripture. It worships as God authorized. We've read several of these passages, so we're not going to take the time to turn to all of them. This worship of the local church. Be turning to Acts 20, please. This worship of the local church is a beautiful expression of how we are unified how we are together. 
And, and so that's what we're supposed to be doing. Even, even while you're meditating on the Lord's Supper, Curtis did a fine job this morning uh, of explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it. Folks, this little silent time is not just so we can hear each other chew the bread. It's not just so we can hear the gulp of the Lord's Supper. Well, he took the juice. We know he took the juice. It's not what we're, we're thinking, thinking deeply about what we're doing, and we're unified in our efforts to do those very things. This is a beautiful expression of us being together and doing exactly what the New Testament church did. Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. This is what the New Testament church did, folks. It came together and took the Lord's Supper. And even in the context of the taking of the Lord's Supper, they turn right around and he preaches to them. That's what the New Testament church does. We were going to read 1 Corinthians 11, but Curtis did a fine job reading that this morning on the table. That's what the New Testament church does. As often as we come together, we're partaking of the very things he told us to take. We're taking of that bread, which represents his body, broken on the cross for my sins. We're taking of that fruit of the vine, which represents his blood that was shed for the remission of sins. That's what we're doing here. Every single element of our worship, folks, goes back to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It goes back to who he is and what he did for us and how we come together to worship and praise his great and holy name. The Lord's Supper is a prime example of that. You could look at the singing of the New Testament church, just a handful of passages we could consider. And yet all of them express that we sing to the Lord. We proclaim praises to His name. We give the songs of thanksgiving to His name. All expressions of a cappella singing. A cappella singing. But we're singing with the heart strings and not the guitar strings. We're expressing our devotion to Him in exactly the way He says to. Remember, the Lordship of Jesus is what binds all of these things together. And so we're doing these very things He's described. Even the contribution is something He's described for Christians to do in 1 Corinthians 16. It's for Christians, it's by Christians. This is why we don't have raffling tickets to raise money for this congregation. And it's why we don't do bake sales to raise money for this congregation. We just replaced these seats about a year ago. We did not do a, a fundraiser, did we? Because this congregation takes the money from the people of this congregation to do this congregation's work. The contribution is for the saints and by the saints. And we see that detailed in the New Testament. All of our activities when we come together Remind us of the authority of God, the steadfastness of His plan for us. When I ask the question, what is the church? What do you immediately think about? Do you appreciate what we've talked about this morning? Do you appreciate this body of saved people? Universal church, the saved of all the ages. That's not a collectivity of churches, that's a collectivity of individuals, people. And then a local church, which is made up of particular Christians in a general location who can all come together in one place under the oversight of shepherds and do exactly what God has called His people to do, worship and praise His great and holy name, serve one another, build each other up, and go share the gospel with the lost and dying world. Let's not be flippant about church stuff. Let's not say denigrating things about this body of people. There was a particular reason I chose Ephesians 5 for our scripture reading this morning. Because in that text, we're not described as just haphazard individuals thrown together by the grace and mercy of God. We're not individuals in Ephesians 5 in verse 24 through 27. We're not individuals who, who just happen to be together. And it's kind of a neat thing. It's kind of fun. In that text, folks, we're described as the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. 
that expresses something much more beautiful, doesn't it? In fact, that's exactly what Paul says in that text, isn't it? He adorns her. He wants her to be everything she should be. And so that one day, the marriage will be finally consummated. It will be brought together. We'll be with Him for all eternity in heaven. That's what He wants for His bride. That's what He guarantees for His bride. A beautiful reunion where we get to share in the Lamb's wedding feast. You only get that by being in the body of the saved people. That people, as Peter talked about in Acts 2, who repented of their sins, confessed that He is Lord and Christ, and were baptized for the remission of their sins. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who's not part of that body of people. We want to help you. This local church is wanting to help you. And if you have a need of the congregation this morning, we'd ask you to make it known now as we stand and as we sing.